If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back. I'm excited, I'm always excited, but today I'm especially excited because we're going to talk about OpSuper. And we have a three people here who were closely involved. Uh, we have Neil Ellis, helicopter pilot, Norris Crooks holder, probably one of the greatest chopper pilots ever. And that's not my own words, many, many people said that to me. Then we have Blackie Swartz, free to battalion. We have Pete Nettlum, free to battalion. But let them talk themselves, let, let them explain themselves. Neil Ellis, sir, welcome here, all of you, very welcome. Can you give us a little bit of a brief background of yourself and then Blackie can take over and then lastly Pete. And the only reason for that is because there's a thing like that in front of me. Okay. Um, Thomas, thanks very much for the opportunity. And it's also a great privilege to have um, uh, Kenny, Blackie and also Pete with us because they were part of the operation. Um, to give you a bit of my background, I'm South African born. I grew up in Rhodesia. I joined the South African Air Force in 1971, and then I'm I trained on uh, Impala jets, and then after a, while, after a couple of years after attaining my wings, end of 72, I then went on to a helicopter in 1975, and that's where the fun started. 1975 was where I started, you know, the bush warfare. I spent a, a couple of tours, well, not a couple, many tours and then Rhodesia, where I'd learned the fire force concept. Um, and that's where I've based most of my operational experience has been based on what I got through the Rhodesian Air Force and Rhodesian Army. After leaving the, uh, the Air Force, South African Air Force, I flew Alouettes. After leaving jets, I became instructor on Harvards. And then I became a helicopter instructor and ended up flying Pumas. After leaving the Air Force, um, I started military contract work um, in places I started off in Bosnia then it was um, uh, Zaire at that stage and after Zaire we went to, I went to Sierra Leone with the executive outcomes and then it was just a number of countries executive I spent eight years in Sierra Leone then I just went to other places all over like um, Azerbaijan I was in Somalia and a couple of other places. But in general, it's been quite an exciting life. And I've met many people. And of course, always fighting wars has been an exciting thing. And I have met some great people, particularly ex-South Africans, of which we are part of talking today. Um, that's basically my background. At the moment, I'm retired. I'm not retired from flying. There's just no work available. But anything that comes up, I'm ready to go. I'm still able to fly, so I'm around. In that's it. Can you swart? Can you pause um, a bit? Of course, uh, thank you for privilege uh, for joining you. Uh, I was I'm a South Af born in South Africa, uh, raised in a middle class family. <clears throat> um, actually, sp spoiled a bit. I did my high school at Greenside High School, where um, James Small was one of my juniors. And uh, at Greenside High, it was predominantly a Jewish school. So cadets and uh, the military stuff was almost taboo. That was a free period for us. So we used to just have a free period and we didn't have browns and khakis and all the khuduntas that goes with it. So, and then in standard eight is, it's great 10 now. You uh, all go to the wall and you get your, fill in your caller papers and which you forget about. And then two years later, you get called up. So I got called up to Middleburg where I got a big surprise when I went to the army because I didn't understand that there were guys that couldn't read and write and we were all thrown together in the deep end. So 
And they also oversubscribed at Middleburg. They had too many intakes. So we didn't have enough plates and farpana to eat out of to have your own one that uh, we had to share them. And you must know after about 4,000 troops have washed them in a dustbin, the, the grease uh, layer gets on it and you get serious chipper guts. So my couple at the time, he thought uh, I had potential to go to, to infantry school. But a, a school friend of mine and a mate of mine still, he said, you must get your military service over. Don't be too good and don't be too bad. Just go in the middle, stay a troop, don't get rank and just, uh, just get your military service finished. So while I was at Forsyth, the corporal asked me again, don't you want to go to infantry school? And that was the turning point where he convinced me. He said, you eat of white plates, you get bread on the table, and there's jam and butter and, and tomato sauce and chutney. So in my mind, I thought, uh, this is quite a good idea. It's two days there to outsourcing from Middleburg or three days. Maybe a day there. If I get RTU'd, that's uh, another three days back. Then I've done five or six days of my military training already. But uh, that didn't work. When I got to infantry school, we get sucked into junior leaders. And, and uh, obviously, at infantry school, you get threatened with your rank all the time. And the longer you stay there, the harder it is to get RTU. Because if you get RTU halfway through the year, then uh, you're the laughing stock. So anyway, fortunately at infantry school, I was in uh, Alpha Company and my platoon was one of the best uh, platoons. And uh, out of our platoon, because we had an older lieutenant that he, um, he, he was on the mine, so he didn't mess us around. He just messed us up. He was a boxer and uh, he sorted us, but he never messed us around. When we went on pass, he said, yes, your pass. And, mm -hmm. and uh, at the beginning, he said to us, don't think because you're a poor hut or a softy that I'm going to make you a loot. You're going to earn, if you become a lieutenant, you're going to earn it. And if you become an NCO, you're also going to earn it. There's no differentiating between the two. So as we went through, we went to the border, our border phase, and uh, Alpha One, my platoon, we had a contact there at Inona. There were 50 of us, about 50 of us, and only three of them. And we only shot two. So it wasn't a very good reflection. But that night it was very quiet in the TV, and uh, that's where I had my first experience. And then I was on pass, one weekend pass, at my cousin's place at the VAR. And there was a, a friend of my cousin's, Anthony Ninova. He said to me, what are you doing next year? I said, no, I'm at infantry school. Um, I don't know where I'm going to go to a SAR unit or something. So he said, if ever you can, come to 3-2. We do it differently and it's really pleasant there. So the seed was planted for me to go to 3 2. And eventually, at the end of the year, they came for caring or selection to uh, go to the Parabats, the Reckies, and 3 2. And out of our platoon, I think there were about seven or eight that volunteered. And uh, we all made it the, the selection. And uh, that, that, that's how I got into 3 2. As a city boy, nightlife into a different world. Well, I think that left us uh, with Pete. Um, yeah, thanks, Chris, for having the opportunity to be on your show. Um, 
I started, um, I, well, I grew up in a small town called Wolseley in the Boerland, uh, in the Western Cape. And I matriculated at um, Boerland Agricultural School in Pau, played rugby for them and a whole lot. And then I had to do my national service and almost the same story than Becky. I thought um, I'm going to keep a very low profile, stay my two years and come home and, and you know, it's done. And uh, yeah, then I went to, I was called up to Six I in uh, Grahamstown and I went there and uh, we were there for about five weeks and then they selected the guys for infantry school and I went to infantry school and I, I enjoyed it pretty much there. It was quite nice and it was a different thing from school and everything, the way you, you get introduced to new friends and you early... You know, it's just a different story. Anyhow, and then from infantry school, while we were there, they came to, to select some guys for 3-2 Battalion. I didn't know anything about 3-2 Battalion. Uh, I think none of us. And uh, yeah, then I ended up going and uh, we were selected and we, we were 18 guys. And we were June intake those days. It just started those days. But, so it was like, like in the middle of the year. So before the course ended, because they needed, did the guys up there so we left in like middle of May we joined 3-2 and uh, then I stayed there till end of June 82 so uh, yeah that was basically my military and then after that I only did camps so and then I, I I'm a wine farmer and I'm still a source I'm sort of semi-retired but I still do a little bit of work and, uh, and drink a lot of wine Oh, that's impressive. Is that uh, picture behind you? Is that all the farm? Yes, that's that's the farm behind me. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of people who would want links to go and see this place. That would be uh, <laughs> would be something else. I see Neil has disappeared. Oh, he's back. Okay. Well, now that we've introduced each other here, I think we should talk about Oak Super. I've heard about Oak Super. I was at school, of course, but it was big in the news. It was one of the major, major battles, I suppose, of the border war. We had a previous guest here, the uh, former commander of uh, Special Forces Brigade, Wim Boris, or General C.J. Bowman. And he was actually one of the planners of, of Oak Super. And he mentions it uh, briefly in one of his episodes. But here we have people who was right inside that battle. And all of them agree that Mr. Ellis, Neil Ellis, the pilot, will actually tell us about it, mostly because he was involved right from the beginning. I do know something happened to the chopper fuel as well regarding uh, a fishing expedition. That's according to, uh, to Uncle Boris. I don't know if that is quite the way it was, but perhaps you can tell us, uh, Neil, where did this start? What happened? Yeah, the actual operation, well, obviously before I got wind of the operation or before I got briefed on the operation, obviously there's some planning and was in process previously because it was a special forces. It's fascinating to me. Hi, Mr. Ellis, are you back? Yeah, I'm sitting in the car and it's and the phone got too hot, so I've had to switch the vehicle and put the air conditioning on to cool it down a bit. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm sitting here in the snow. Okay, well, um, Thanks. I think we should start again at the beginning where you were saying it started with the Special Forces guys. I think they ran into what, 12 Swapu guys and shot nine gotcha. and captured three, and from that came all the... But perhaps you can just explain that to us and I'll keep quiet again. Okay, I'll start from the beginning. Okay, what happened is that um, obviously I wasn't part of the the planning in the beginning but according to the knowledge that i was told well in fact i only got to, i was the first i heard of operation super was at an early morning briefing on the 8th now obviously um of the 8th of if i remember correctly it was the 8th of march yeah 8th of march 1982 um i was the helicopter chief at ondongwa in charge of the alouette or the, the alouette gunship flight commander I was there permanently with my family. Um, what happened is that 
as I said previously, is that there must have been some planning because based on intelligence received by the military intelligence, passed on to the Special Forces Command. And then once the operation had been given a go, we from the Air Force side were roped in. Initially, we didn't expect there would be any presence in that part of the area. I'm talking from the Air Force side, but, you know, it's, it's, it goes about what the Army wants and we in support of the, the Army operations. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we were called into um, to, to, to the briefing on the 8th, early morning 8th. And then once I heard what was happening, I was quite excited because we didn't expect any uh, anything to happen at all. Uh, we just thought we're going up to the Marion Fluss, that area, for a couple of days. Um, that's where the attack HQ was going to be based in the Marion Fluss. And I'd been there uh, about five, many five or six years previously before the war was on the go, the Bush border was on the go. So it was a nice opportunity to go back there because there's, there's game there, there's elephants. Um, when I was in the Mar Marion Fluss earlier on, there was yellow, it was covered in grass. It was game, Ireland, any, it was beautiful, really beautiful part of the world. And we thought, you know, at least if we can get down to the beach, we might be able to swim in the sea, the Atlantic, and maybe even if we got a fishing rod or two, we could catch a couple of fish. Anyway, so we were briefed him. I had a wingman called Angelo Maranta. My gunner at that stage was Steve Pizzia. And we left, we took off for the Marian Fluss about midday to be there late afternoon, um, where we'd have a, you know, obvious meet up with the reconnaissance guys that were working with us. And from then on, you know, that that was the, the, the basis to, or the preliminary background to the operation itself. Um, as I said, when we got to the area, we did not expect that we would really be used on anything. So we prepared just to sit around for a couple of days while the reconnaissance commando, the team was deployed to recce the area and then come up with some information to confirm if the information was correct or not. So that night we sat around, we had a braai, had a couple of beers, chatted with the recce guys. The next morning we had detailed briefing about search and rescue, where we're we going to deploy, how we're we going to deploy. And, and we would drop them off in that evening. Um, if there's, I'm just coming in now. If there's anything anybody else wants to add, then just stop there. Tell me to stop. Okay. All right. That morning, after all the briefings, um, the plan was that we would take off towards Last Light to drop the reconnaissance team led by Sergeant Dennison um, north of the area, suspected area called, and that was I, that's north of the Marian Fluss. It's a small, well, I believe it's a small town, but I've never seen any buildings there or anything, but the place was called Iona. And we took off um, towards last light so that we could drop the guys off um, at the, the pre-planned position at the, where they decided to go. After dropping off, we returned back to our TAC HQ at the Mario Fritz itself on the airfield. Um, if you can call it the airfield, it was just a stretch of desert sand marked by 44 gallon drums. And that night, we were just sat around once again, having a bride, drinking a couple of beers. And if I remember correctly, it was around about nine o'clock that night, we heard an explosion. And obviously, it sounded like it was distant, but there can only be one thing it could be a landmine. Now we knew that the special forces group were going to mine the road with the landmine. So then it was pretty much confirmation that something was happening in the area. So we thought, well, here's time. Now the operation is going to start. Here. There's going to be something and maybe, maybe there will be, we will have a fight. Anyway, that night, we slept that night. We went to bed, slept. Uh, it was pretty warm. That part of the world is very warm. And I remember we were sleeping in, in tents on stretches. Um, and uh, there was a little bit of a wind, otherwise nothing happened. Next morning we woke up for breakfast, um, and then we had a briefing that a truck, indeed a truck, a big Mercedes truck, had passed the road. The, the recce team had observed it that night. They didn't see much any of much else or any other vehicles. To, I'm not too sure, possibly there were. And, we, and then it, everything was quiet. 
So our leader, the Puma pilot leader, our major Paula Kriya, who is now passed on, he said we need to go down the river, the Kunini River, to look for possible crossing points. Now, the background to Op Super was that the intelligence had picked up that there was uh, that Swapo were intending to open up a new front in the west of Angola, west of uh, Namibia, then southwest Africa, to come through the Kaika Felt and then get it back into Avamba land that way. Because coming through Avamba land across the normal route at Long Giveaway was not easy, you know, because we were operating, we had lots of troops in that area. So since nothing was happening, we decided to give all the cooks and the bottle washers a bit of a jolly. So we piled them into the helicopter and we headed off to the beach, which is about maybe half an hour's flying with the Puma half an hour, 30 minutes away. We went to the beach and we had to, everybody went for a swim. We got some mussels to bring back. No fishing, no bit of fishing rod. And so we came back on the, uh, then we, we, flew, we, we flew back to the TAC HQ at the Molly and Fluss. On the way back, Paula Korea desolated for me to come to the front because I was sitting in the back of the Puma, you know, and he came to the front and the flight engineer gave me his headset and Paul O'Clear said, these guys are now being harassed by a Swapo. They've been chased by a Swapo. And I say, these guys, a recce team, have been chased by a Swapo and um, we need to get there to give them support because they were, I think if I remember correctly, they were maybe about six or seven of, of the of our reckeys, and they were being chased by a platoon, a swapper. Anyway, so now obviously the panic's on. So we full speed ahead. We got into the base where our um, the, the, the recce commander, the, the ops commander on the ground, he wasn't happy because we went there, but that's fine. You know, he agreed for us to go, so we couldn't complain too much. But so we, we got a quick briefing where the guys are, and then. Um, we, we climbed into our helicopters, uh, the two LOS. We got going, and um, to go and see, to go and have a look and see what was going on. When we got to the area, we could see that the the recce team had got onto a small copy, a small little rocky hill, and um, we could see that the swiper guys were actually busy advancing onto them. They were quite close. I reckon, I think the the contact had actually started because we could see burning grass and. You know, that sort of stuff. And, and all Dennison wasn't too happy. Sergeant Dennison wasn't too happy because he said, you know, you're supposed to be helping at us. And um, if you'd have been yesterday, you would have been of assistance. But it's, so anyway, everybody's upset because, let's face it, 30 against five or six on the ground is not fun. It could have been more. Anyway, so, but it was easy. It, it wasn't really difficult because it was pretty open ground. These, uh, all the reckeys were on a copy. And then the Swapo guys were advancing on them. So it was became a bit of a turkey shoot. We only had one um, team that we could deploy, a section that we could deploy to, to join the fight of 3-2, a section of 3-2. And so we put them on the ground. And then I managed to direct, by using fire, I managed to get the Swapo guys to run into the direction of the stopper group, the 3-2 stopper group. So out of the 20, if I remember correctly, there was, uh, let me see, I think we, we killed, I think we killed about 17 or 18 of them, captured six, and then one got away, something like that. So um, it turned out to be quite a successful exercise. At one stage, you know, because the fuel, we had a very short plan on a big operation at Mariamsfluss, and we had a bit of a shortage of fuel, and the Pumas were... Um, running around, you know, they were flying, doing other jobs. So in the end, myself and Angela had to land on the hilly of the copy, and then I controlled the fire for firefight from the hill, looking down, because we could see everything quite clearly, you know, control the advancing of the troops and that sort of stuff and mopping up operations. And then when, once the contact was over, the Pumas came and landed and dropped off the field. But now we had captures. We had six guys captured. So it was going to make life easier because once you've got a capture, you can always interrogate them and then find out, you know, what's going on in the area, which subsequently happened. Okay, I'm stopping now. Uh, Robert, you want me to carry on? Or you want me to stop? 
No, I would love you. I'd love you to carry on. I think it's okay. it's fascinating. Right. Okay. All right, I'll start as that. Okay, then we deployed back to base. And we had the six captains. Oh, Fester, the captain Fester, he interrogated the guys and we, we found out there was a base quite close by and there was 250 in the base. So now we were two gunships, two Pumas, and maybe a section, maybe, I can't remember, but I said it was a section of guys. So it wasn't many, it was too small a force to take on that base. Anyway, we ascertained more or less where the base was. Then um, the next day, that night, we slept that night because we couldn't do anything. We were hopelessly undermanned, underarmed. We didn't have enough ammunition to take on a base of that size. So then the preparation was made to deploy more three troops uh, for the next day. Uh, we, needed, we needed another two gunships and we needed another some more Pumas. So in the end, and that day, another two gunships, gunships from Andong arrived and we got another three Pumas. Plus we got a substantial, we're not substantial, we got, I think we got a platoon of three, two, and uh, Captain Jan Hogarth. Um, we planned that day for an operation and the guys wanted us to go in into that operation but on the way and I was against it and the reason why I'm against it is because first of all I was using a fire force operational technique where it's a slow process you don't rush into these things it's a very slow process and you can't go at first lights because the reason being is because the shadows on the ground, the guys can hide under bushes and, and trees, and it's very difficult to detect them on a helicopter. So you need to start attacking around about eight, nine o'clock when the sun's a bit up and you've got a bit of light to see underneath the trees. And also you need about, a, for a big operation like that, you need at least five to six hours. And now the ground, the, the, the ground commanders from Washakarti and... Um, you know, I'm talking about the military command and then, of course, our ground commanders on the ground because we've been reinforced by other operational commanders from Washington. They wanted to attack at four o'clock. I was against it. Anyway, who am I? was just a captain at that stage and it was an army operation. So we took off. And on the way in, um, we, we hit a rainstorm. And that's when I said, we, luckily, on our side, this is a God's gift. So I turned back, everybody went back so we, because we couldn't see anything. It was bad, the rain was heavy. So we went back to base and landed and then replanned. And that was quite fortunate because certain events happened. Uh, I think maybe Kenny should come in here. Kenny, do you want to come in? You and Pete want to say something so long? Pete wants to say, what does that mean? Yes or no? No, I said no. Okay, all right. Kenny, you want to say when you guys, because you guys were called in around about the same time. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to rewind a bit. Um, of course, after our selection, uh, all the white guys with the leader group were put together as a platoon, and they flew us into different areas in Angola to try to get some combat experience before we got our, our troops, which obviously they had a lot more experience. They had been fighting a war for a long time. We were just from infantry school. So, so we, uh, we did a white ops in the Zongonga area and a few areas around there, which nothing came about. And uh, if I remember, we came back from that ops on the, we went in on Christmas day and we came out on the 15th of January. And uh, then I was dealt into Foxtrot Company, which were going to troop again on the 17th. They were going back into the bush after their bush leaves. So we were going with them. So we went into the bush for our bush trip, and that was Opsansak. And uh, it was six or seven weeks, we came back and we landed at Hurricane Base at Trakana. And uh, we were the first company to come back, Fox Ross Company, of the three companies that were in the bush. And uh, 
as usual, my company commander was the first on the flossy to Buffalo so he could have cold beer and, and clean up. And he made me stay behind as the, the tail. And uh, while I was there, then the, 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 I was put on fire for standby for, that, for the recce group. But it, because it was a top secret uh, operation, I was a young lieutenant, I never had security clearance and neither did Louis, uh, my platoon uh, second. So we were waiting for um, authority from, from high up to come down to, to allow us to go to Morian Fris. And then when we got the um, clearance to go to Morian Fris, uh, when we arrived there, as Neil said, I, I think there was just one signal tent with a recce signaler in it, three or four old uh, 44 gallon drums and an old torn windsock that was shredded. And uh, then we we had to wait and Neil thought it was gonna be a lemon. That's why they went to, to, the, to the mouth of the Kaneni, to the sea. But uh, as he says, and as Commandant Borman or General Borman said, um, they were found out. They were actually on a jolly, not on a recce. And, and Neil, I see him smiling there because he knows that's the truth. But it's come out, so it uh, doesn't matter. And then while they were on the way back, the, the, the Colonel, um, Commandant, not sorry, Commandant, uh, Major Kutsia, he was jumping up and down because these guys were going to be compromised. And these guys were on their way back. But fortunately, they weren't too far away. So it didn't take them too long to. In that time, I was prepared with my section and, uh, and Wally Aldane because he didn't want to miss the action. We jumped on it and the choppers. But my briefing was we were going to more or less do hot extraction for the Rekis. Because one, one Puma was empty, we were sectioning one, and the gunships had gone ahead. And um, when we got to the area, the flight engineer of the Puma said, I must get out. And I thought he was mad because there's so much noise in the Puma that you can't hear. And I was telling him, no, we're going to do pick up the Rekis. And he was telling me to get out. So we got out, went into all round cover. And then Neil took over, he started talking to me on the ground. We, I think we put out, uh, we had Daiglo Sun in our pushets. So we turned them up and Neil got us into a attack formation. And as he says, it, the terrain was quite soft at that stage. And we started the attack. On, on that attack, we had just started and I had a, a troop called Kafuna. And uh, the next minute, he shot a guy in front of me. And I said, what are you doing? He said, no, there's a guy in front of you. So he actually saved my life there. Or well, it depends on whether there was a good shot or not. And we, we carried on advancing and we started getting the dead bodies. And there was a... <clears throat> An RPG gunner that had been shot, or he was carrying the RPG bombs, or he thought he was shot, but he was pretending he was dead. And as we were walk past in the sweep line, he shot him, and it nearly hit me again. And I said to him, "Gafuna, what are you doing?" And he said, "No, that guy was still alive, and to put an extra two taps in him just to make sure he was dead." And as we progress we've got the wounded and uh Wally Aldane took one and, and used him as like almost as a human shield and there was another one that I had that had been shot through the knee but uh, due to the adrenaline he was walking as if his leg was normal and those were the guys that uh, were taken back to Morian Fluss and interrogated for the information for the big base and while we were dropped, 
the Pumas went back and brought back my other stick of my platoon. And uh, by that stage, the firefight was over. So they just helped uh, clear the target area. And then we all went back to Marion Fruce. Thanks, Chris. Neil? Right. Um, okay, then as I'm going back, then, then that night, when we turned back, um, and we landed after the rainstorm, we landed. And then fortunately, um, Oshakati had flown in, a, you know, an intelligence officer who was professional at interrogating prisoners. His name was Major uh, Kutsia. Now, Major Kutsia was a brute of a man. When I say brute, he was over six feet. He was built like a rugby player, broken teeth, but a, a really good guy. You know, he was married to a ballet dancer, which is quite really surprising. Did you think if somebody looking like that could marry such a petite ballet dancer. But anyway, he, had a, he was a, actually quite a humble guy. He interrogated the prisoners again to find out exactly where is the camp. And he was, he never, there was no slapping, there was no shouting, and no beating or electric shocks, what you see in the movies. All he sat there, he put the guy in front of him. On the, the guy was sitting on the ground, the prisoner sitting on the ground, and he sat on a stool in front of the prisoner and just put his big army foot on the other guy's foot. And just that, I think just that physical contact. And there was no pain, the guy didn't scream or squirm, but you could see, he realized that if he didn't talk, he was going to end up having this big foot crush his own foot. Anyway, so he went through all the prisoners and they came through with the same story that the camp, there was, there was a big camp of 250 people. And that our original, position what we thought from the previous interrogation was wrong. So it was very fortunate that the, our first attempt at attacking the base was thwarted by the rainstorm and we turned back. Um, so we, the, we, and I'll, I'll, could see I got the guys on the ground to actually build a sand model of the area and of the base, which of course was, 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 was fantastic because now we had a good idea where the eating area is, you know, in a, in a, in a coin warfare camp, it's, it's where, you know, with these guys, these terrorist camps, there's no buildings, there's, there's normally there's not even trenches. It's just an area which identifies the cooking area, and then you have a sleeping area, and then maybe a small parade ground. But I mean, there's a big camp, so the parade ground was quite big. It is, so now we had a good thing, so we replanned our attack. So the next morning, um, we took off quite early, around about eight o'clock. Uh, we loaded up at that stage, as I say, we had uh, the four gunships, the LOA three gunships, each armed with a 20 millimeter cannon out the side. And then we had five pumas. Four pumas for trooping and one puma for a mortar section. Um, so we took off and I was, I was leading the formation and we left two gunships in reserve. The idea being is that Myself with my Angelo, we would be the leaders. We would initiate the contact. And we had about each, each gunship had just over an hour's fuel. So we would, be, we would be on target for 45 minutes. And then at that stage, the, the, the reserve gunships would, be, uh, would have joined us. And while we were refueling, they would take over the fight. So that was the sort of plan of action for how we were going to do it. The Pumas would take off. Uh, take off a little bit after us because they're much faster than the Alouette and it, it was more convenient for them also as a fuel saver, uh, not only a fuel saver, but they can't fly. We don't want them to fly slow because they get vulnerable and could be shot down depending if there was anything in the area that could shoot the Puma down. So normally they would wait about five minutes before taking off and then we would fly over, identify the holding area. And the Pumas would go to what we had as yes, a holding area for them. And then um, they would orbit that area while we look for the camp, initiate the contact, and then start determining where we're going to put down the stopper groups. Now to get back into a bit of theory, the idea of a fire force operation is to, um, obviously you've got your gunships and you've got your trooping helicopters to drop off what we call stopper groups, which are in a stopper group, is actually a section of guys, it doesn't matter how many people in Indonesia would be four people. And in South Africa, I think we use, we would use 
between eight and twelve, depending on how how the operation was and how many how many troops you could fit into the Puma. So we'd have what we'd call a plan A. Plan A would be when we'd have a look at the area and de- try and determine which way uh, the enemy is going to run. Now, generally speaking, from experience, the enemy would run either downhill and follow river gullies. So obviously on the map, you do a pre-map study of your attack and you look for the gullies where you think they're going to run. That's what you call plan alpha, plan B, uh, plan alpha. So the, the Puma pilots will be briefed. You, the chances are you're going to be dropping your troops off in this position. But that's not always the case because once you get there, you know, things change. So you've got to determine where are the enemy going to run and um, that you can only determine once you're overhead. Uh, and, and then once you determine the, the air, the, the direction of flight, that's where you start looking at where you're going to put your stopper groups. And that would be plan B. So if plan A didn't work according to pre-flight briefing and planning, then you go to plan B because then it's off the cuff. Then you just decide this is how it's going to be and then you forget about plan A. Anyway, to go back to Operation Super, myself and Steve and Angela, we were overhead orbiting. And we couldn't find the camp. Um, there was just nothing. We couldn't see anything. You know, you could see signs of footpaths, but there wasn't really much to see. But also, you know, you know I like taking off a bit late, but we were on, we took off too early, and the, the shadows were, were, you know, from the sun, the rising sun, they were still quite dark. Anyway, orbiting the area, and it looked like there was black rocks or dark brown rock rocks. And uh, that's strange to find these rocks in that area because it was completely different from, you know, you go about half a kilometer away and you don't see these black rocks. Anyway, we start orbiting. And then Steve said to me, he says, those are bivvies. Those are tents. No, not rocks, they're tents. And then it's just like, you know, like an eye opener. Everything just, your whole eye just opens up. And then you can see, right, those are bivvy tents. And out of, out of the bivvy tents, you see, legs sticking out there. It looks like like insects, you know, with long legs, like uh, crabs or whatever. And then they start looking under the bushes and you could see people. And, you know, all the guys is about five people under a small bush and their heads and their bodies under the small bush, but their legs are sticking out. And they look like starfish type thing. And then we knew the game was on. So now it goes about where are we going to drop the stopper groups? So we're orbiting, trying to look as though we hadn't really picked up the guys on the ground because we don't want to start shooting too early because then you don't want to you want to you want to create an organized panic that you are in control of you don't you want the enemy to panic but in the panic that you want them to, in the way you want them to panic so that's why you orbit a little bit slowly around them ignoring them and of course they're on the ground you're trying to ignore you hoping you're going to go away but we had them so then it's to bring the pumas in. It also gives us time to bring the pumas in and to um, put the stopper groups down. Now, the puma holding area was a little bit far away, I suppose. But anyway, on the then, while we were waiting for the pumas to come in to do the plan alpha drop, then you could see, then the guys, you could see the, the movement starting. And you can see one guy would start crawling. And then the guys next to him would start crawling. And then the other guys would start crawling. And they're not running yet. So, you know, like, now you start picking up which way they're crawling. And they're crawling more or less in the direction where you were hoping they'd crawl on plan A. So, I start the pumas to bring in to put down the stopper groups as we had wanted them to be and planned. And that was down the gullies. And then once, once, they, once the, 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 the enemy, the, the terrorists, heard the pumas coming, then they could now you know, there's, there's noise above the elevate noise. They can hear the pumas coming in. Then they start running. So there's a mad rush to get the poops on the ground with the stopper groups, which we accomplished in as planned. And I, you know, even to this certain extent, I remember dropping one puma, and I think it was where we dropped Nella off. I'm not quite sure, but I remember I think it was Nella. We dropped him on the ground, and when the puma was on the ground, those terrorists were around about 100 meters away running towards him. So as soon as the guys jumped out the puma, and they were on the ground. They were in the five fights. It was actually quite close. Um, then, then we just started shooting the guys. You know, I had I had two Sam Sevens launched at me. 
but fortunately, you know, to, I did, even before then, I wasn't worried about SAM 7s because our guys in the CSIR, they had developed countermeasures in the form of the, the air, air halo, which was painted with a special paint. Plus, the engine was covered with what you call the shroud. So SAM 7 to me wasn't really a big worry, but obviously, um, it's like anything else. It's if a bullet or a big thing is coming towards you, even though you feel quite safe, you never know. Maybe today is a different day. But the, the, the two Sams passed by me. And one went. One was shot at Angelo, um, and of course it just passed by him. And then we just started shooting at the guys, and then the kill rate was quite good. Um, I think now Blackie should start. Blackie and Pete should start talking now. Um, I think I just missed out a little bit on the day of the 12th, uh, which was the Friday, because we, when we, we arrived at Ruakana on the 11th, late afternoon. Um, why I'm saying this, I just want to bring you into the picture why, why Golf Company had to go back and Kenneth, why they were still there, because they were supposed to leave and go back to Buffalo to go and rest, and we just came in. And when we landed at Ruakana, um, Jan Ochard was there and uh, one or two of his platoons, and they, they've just landed from the bush, and they said to us, we must get in immediately. But we were not ready because we still had to organize food and ammo and all the rest. And then Jan decided to take his one platoon, which was the platoon of Nella and Peter Burley, Golf 26, to take them back to Marien Flush. Um, because they needed uh, that evening to have a, uh, I think they went out that night already as a stopper group. And yes, then we stayed that night at uh, Ruakana and the Friday morning of the 12th, we flew in by helicopters to, to Marien Flush. And when we got there, I can't remember the time, but it was in the morning, they had the sand model, which Neil was talking about, and uh, we got a briefing about it and what is where, and it's, yeah, you sort of make a picture in your head of what to expect. And then that afternoon, I can't remember exactly the time that we left. It was like four o'clock, I think, Neil. We went out um, for the first time to Marine Flush, from Marine Flush to the, to the contact area. And then it was raining so much that the helicopters, had, well, Neil and them decided to turn around. It was just too dangerous. To, to cross the mountains. And then we came back to the Marine Flush, which gave us a little bit more time um, to, to go through the sand model again and another briefing from the one recce guy that was still there and more planning. And then the Saturday morning, the 13th of March, um, that's when we went in eight o'clock. I can come in. On, on, after the sand model in the briefing, the, the H hour was one o'clock on the Friday to, to go in. And when we got in the Pumas, all of us, the our deck group, it was such a beautiful sight when the, the, the gunships and the Pumas took off and we left. And because of the weather, the, the Puma pilots, I think they thought they could fly up over the storm. Because I remember you could just see a, a chopper, like a speck in the air above you when we were trying to go over the clouds. And then, then we turned around and came back because of the weather. I think we might have even landed in the bush, I'm not sure, for a short while for the, the, the real heavy storm to get over and then fly back to Morian Fris. But uh, of course, just with that, a little bit of rain. There were a few drops in the desert. The next day, for maybe an hour till the sun came out, it looked like a bowling green, that, that desert. But there was only a piece of grass here and a piece of grass there. And it was beautiful. It looked like a bowling green. And then when the sun came out, the heat, it uh, killed it. And then it was back to the desert. So that's a memory that will always stay in my mind, is that... Uh, Bowling Green Desert, that had a blade of grass here and a blade of grass there. May I ask you two gentlemen of the army, what do you feel when you're boarding those helicopters and you know you're heading into a contact 
and probably a major one. What goes through your head? Well, if I may answer, because it's when you're sitting in the door, because we fly with in the open door, you focused, you just thinking about your training that you've done or that, that sort of the training and how you're going to deal with the, the situation, but 100% focused. Peter, I don't know. I I will also say if you when you you know when you go into contact, especially like that was the first time that I was flown into a, a contact, and the, the previous contacts I were in, we were on the ground, and then it was like a surprise. But this time we knew what was going to happen, and uh, yeah, you could you could get there, you know, to the base, and it could have been a dry run. They could have fled through the night before. Um, but yeah, but they could also still be there. And we were only 46 people. And, um, but I think what, what um, when you get to the ground, um, you, you do what you were trained. It, it comes automatically. Because uh, on the day of the attack, of, uh, Saturday the 13th, uh, the same drill, we in the choppers and taking off, it actually was, Quite a beautiful day, if I remember. And when we got in the holding area over near the target area, while Neil and the gunships were looking for the target, um, when Neil started shooting and they took us to drop us off, because of the SAM 7s and the small mortar fire and shooting at the choppers and the RPGs, they just dropped us where they could just get on the ground and get us out so they could take off again. And once again, we had the day glow in our heads and uh, Neil was able to bring some uh, control over the line. And during the fight, sometimes the bush was so thick and the rocks was, it was, the terrain was terrible. One platoon or one section would move in front of the other one and uh, we'd have to slow down or one uh, platoon or section would be pinned down where and the rest of the line were moving. We had to stop and till the firefight was won again and then move on. If I may ask something here, who was in command of the ground forces at this stage? Because it seems to me that you couldn't really keep full control here because you couldn't see because of a... Of a the way where the area was, the bushes, and then so so. How did you organize yourself? If Neil wasn't there, what would have happened? Because uh, we had a, a command group, uh, 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 Captain Ochot and uh, Lawrence Duplessis and Wally Aldane. They they were back and apparently looking down on because we were on on the the slopes or the mountains. So. They could see, but after a while, Neil saw it wasn't working and he took over because he had control from the air. They could never control us from the back because there were, uh, like at one stage, breakaway groups, then I'd have to do a flank attack until they sorted out and then come back to the line. And that's how it went in the beginning. So, yeah, it was. Uh, Neil actually ran and the, the, the gunships saw that ran it from the air. From the ground, I don't think that we had much success from them running because they couldn't see her. Peter, you agree with us? Yes, I will say if, if, if the Air Force, the helicopters weren't there, um, we wouldn't have been able to, to fight this fight. Um, we would have killed each other uh, by walking in front of each other because when we started, when we were offloaded, and by the time we got into one like extended big line to attack, um, we were already then in the contact, and we started shooting. And then you got to these flippin' river beds that um, some are high and some are low, and and that's where they were hiding. So maybe we get into the river bed before uh, Kenneth did, 
and then he can still move because they, they don't uh, get fired on that, at that stage where we were pinned down and you couldn't move. And that's where I think where the helicopters came in and Neil could then guide Kenneth and, and the other guides and say, listen, guys, at this stage, the left flank is pinned down. They can't move. So you beat it. You rather stop and then just wait. And then when, when we got like over that one, then we continued for the next one. And then everybody moved a bit. Neil, if I may ask you a question, I have great admiration for the Rhodesian Armed Forces. And there's really a lot of things we've learned from them. And Fire Forces is one of the best. But in the original concept, and correct me if I'm wrong, the ground commander would actually be in the other way, commanding, and he would be sitting facing backwards with his back towards the shield. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, you're correct. Um, but with, you see, the problem was we, we did it a little bit differently to the Rhodesian forces. We had a problem that our distances were greater than in Rhodesia. In Rhodesia, you'd have a fuel, your fuel would be placed you know, in your operational area. You, you wouldn't fly more than 20 minutes to get fuel. That's the first thing. But we would be flying, uh, I mean, we were going miles to get fuel. You know, so we, we didn't have that privilege of being able to put fuel in an area where it would be kept safe because of the distances. So from our side, we elected not to take the ground commander with us um, for two reasons. One is because nobody was trained in fire force operations. The South African Defense Force didn't really believe it would work in Southwest Africa and Southern Angola, which is, we proved them wrong. And um, so I, I, working with 3-2 was actually wonderful because we had commanders, you know, the, the 3-2 uh, regiment battalion commander like um, Falcon and others, they had faith in us in the Air Force being able to control the troops on the ground. Now, to go back to the fire force concept of operations, the whole thing is to put troops on the ground and then you control them from the air, as you correctly said, like in Rhodesia, where the army commander was sitting in the Alouette and he would command the ground troops. And then the air force commander, the air force uh, formation leader would be controlling the air, the air. I'm sure Neil will be back right now. Of course, so while we're waiting for Neil to come back, uh, in that, when we first, before we took our first losses, um, when, we, when we were pinned down, my, my section or my platoon was pinned, it was heavy, uh, small uh, arms fire and mortars, but the mortars weren't very effective. If they used them closer to us, I think you'll we'll agree that it would have been deadly to us because of the, the rocks sending more shrapnel than, than we could expect. But uh, in that contact, there was never shame about uh, if you couldn't take it at 3-2. It was, you know, it, you could leave with pride. You know, it wasn't for everybody. And we were told that if, and there were guys that, that left because they couldn't handle the pressure. But I remember in that, when our heads were down and the bullets were whistling over our head, I was saying, geez, if, we get, if I get out of this one, I'm gonna go to the commanding officer and tell him he can keep his job. I, I would rather go to a side in it. But afterwards, when uh, it's over, then you think oh, it wasn't so bad. Uh, it wasn't that bad. Uh, Neil's back. Sorry, I'm back. I'm back. My phone, my phone keeps on cutting out because of the temperature. I'm sitting in the vehicle with the air conditioner on and I'm trying to charge the phone. So the phone keeps on overheating. I apologize. All right, you want? Shall I yes, carry we on? Were, we were explaining the difference between the Rhodesian Fire Force concept and the one in in the yeah, SADF, okay. and then that the ground commander would not be on the on the Air Force helicopters. Of course, you were also flying a gunship, which I suppose also yes. limited weight. 
you know, as, as I said, okay, so then in the South Africa, of course, we were working with 3-2 with some wonderful battalion commanders who were entrusting us. Um, and so the Air Force would actually become the ground, the, 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 air, the, the, the pilot, the formation leader, he would control the aircraft and he would control the sweep lines on the ground. And um, we developed a system and we had the trust of the guys on the ground and the commanders to be able to do that. And there weren't many of us that could do it really well. Um, one guy particularly was Arthur Walker, who is now dead. He was very, very good at it, but he was also trained in Rhodesia. He flew gunships in Rhodesia, so we, 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 we sorted it out. Anyway, so going back to Op Super, um, the whole thing is to is what, what Peter and also Peter alluded to, as well as, as, as Kenny, is that the whole is to get the sweep lines moving forward in our direction to the objective and to prevent them from having blue on blue and in fact fight, firing at each other, which does happen, it has happened. And then the other, the other way of doing it because we're using an alouette and we're flying a left-hand orbit. And the reason why we're flying the left-hand orbit because we're orbiting the position and we can see clearly what's happening on the ground. We can see where the enemy is unless he's camouflaged himself so we can't see him. But the main thing is we can see the troops moving forward because they've got day glow. You know, we give them day glow and also we can see the movement. So that is how we can prevent them from either going in the wrong direction as well as having contact with each other. So that is that is the main concept. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yes, indeed it does. Thank you. So where we are right now is you found the enemy. You started to contact, you opened up, you started shooting at them. At the same time, the Pumas has a much bigger helicopter has deployed, has deployed Blackie as well as Pete. Were you deployed by that time or at the same time or did you come in a little bit later or earlier? No, we, we, were, we, were, we were offloaded exactly at the same time. Okay, thanks. So you were then all of it, you formed the skirmish line. Perhaps one of you soldiers can explain to our viewers here, what is a skirmish line? What do you mean when you say you formed the line? Well, basically, it is when, when, when we got out of the helicopters, you first organize your own troops. The biggest thing at that stage was to understand what which side was the enemy, because the choppers make some noise, um, the shooting, and you don't know where it comes from, because it's noise all over the place. And the minute the pumas left, it was a bit easier. And then we realized which way we had to go, because we could see where the Alouettes were circling, and that was, that was then supposed to where the base was. And then after we had our own troops in line, then we linked up with, with Kenneth and Louis on, on, on our right-hand side. And with the help of Neil and the other pilots, they, they could control us and get us in a nice straight line. And then you walk basically, um, I'll say, five to ten meters apart from each other, and that's the line that you form. And that, that's how you are you um, attack. And that's what I meant when I said, then if the one side of the line draws more fire, then, then the other side doesn't know because everybody is doing his own thing. And luckily we had very good uh, radio comms with each other. Um, so we could, we could talk to, to the pilots, we could talk to the, the leaders in the line and we could control ourselves also a little bit by the help of Neil. Can I come in now? I'm just going to what Peter's just said. First of all, there's a lot of noise because the alouettes are circling above. And the thing is, is to get you, when the troops are dropped, they don't really know exactly where the target is or the objective or which direction they've got to walk in. So once the troops are dropped and they've organized themselves, then let's say I, I refer to myself, let's say the pilot. The pilot will fly his helicopter. He will be talking to the troops because one of the prerequisites for this type of operation you have to do and it's imperative you have good communications you've got to have good ground to air communications with the troops on the ground so once they're on the ground they organize themselves and you give them a direction to walk in now either you can give them a direction by a compass which is not really practical because the troops have just got on the ground now he's got to haul out a compass and start um, working out which way to go or the other way, which we normally did, we would fly overhead them and say, right, you've got me visual. Now walk in that direction, form up, 
And that is a direction you're going to move in. And then, of course, we would say turn left or turn right because we could see them on the ground. Now, another thing is if there are many helicopters in the area, um, more than one gunship, then the troops on the ground don't know who's talking to them. So I used to tape a day glow panel to the tail boom, to my the tail boom of the aircraft, which didn't impress many people in command or even other pilots because they thought it was dangerous. But what they didn't understand that I put that day glow right at the back of the helicopter. So if they're going to shoot at, the, at me, which obviously they would do because I'm unusual, then they'd shoot at the day glow panel and then it would miss. That's the theory. Obviously, it didn't work all the time because sometimes they're bad shots and they hit the aeroplane they weren't supposed to hit. So that, that's the actual concept of what, what uh, uh, the, the command helicopter would be doing or the guys controlling the troops. Can I come in there? A question you asked about what do you feel before you go into contact? Um, I'm sort of digressing a bit. But from a pilot's point of view, first of all, if I talk for myself, it's already the adrenaline's flowing. You know, you're going into a battle, you're going into a fight, and it's going to be exciting. Exciting from fear, you get a lot of fear, but not so much before the start, because as, as Kenny said, you are focused. You've got to focus. I used to start sleep. I was, didn't have much sleep the previous night because I'd visualize from start, from startup, or even from the briefing to startup to flying the route. So I'd memorize the route. I'd memorize the area of operations of the map. And then I'd memorize where the troops are going to be put down. So when I got to that area, I had a good idea what was going to happen. It's just planning. You can't just go in there indiscriminately. You know, fighting a battle is like, it's, 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 it's almost like a computer game, I suppose, if the youngsters would call it today. You have to know what you're doing. And if you know what you're doing, then you, you can't go in there willy-nilly and sort of ad hoc thing. You've got a plan. Because if you, if you do go in there and the plan doesn't work, then at least you've got a basis from which to work on. Another thing I used to do, I used to get up long before anybody else and go and shave. The reason for that is because of, I thought if I ever got shot down and captured, at least I would be better looking and cleaner and looking much better than my captors. So it would give me that advantage. <laughs> I was never captured, so I can't, I can't relate it. Well, I can, that's what I did, but I can't say what happened, would have happened if I'd got caught. Then going in, once you start that aircraft, when you're doing your pre-flight and everything, you are so focused because everything must be right. You go in and once you take off and when you take off and that's when your concentration is there. And then, the, you know, that's when you're talking on the radio. So you're getting formations going. You're talking to the pyramids. You're saying, where are you? Are you ready in the holding area? So all this is just before the battle starts. This is what's happening. And then, of course, the adrenaline is there. And once you pick up that enemy on the ground and then the fun starts, that is when it really becomes intense. And the shooting, and you know, they're shooting at you. Those rounds are coming past. You know, the RPGs, the SAM 7s. Another thing, we used to take on 14 fires. You know, the Air Force were pretty upset with me because I developed a, a tactic, if I can call it, procedure for taking on anti-aircraft weapons with the Alouettes. The Air Force commanders would say that is a job for the Impalas and the, the, you know, the Mirages. But then we didn't always have Mirages and Impalas available. So then it was left to the, to the gunships. And we weren't allowed to do it, but you can't leave the guys on the ground. But the Air Force expected the troops to take on 14 fires, but you can't do that. I mean, that's it's not fair on the guys on the ground. So I used to have a, 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 I developed a tactic where I could do it. And I, we, we, it succeeded on, I, of course, I took 14 five rounds. I mean, it's, it's inevitable. You go and take on a weapon of that sort, you will get hit. But the main thing was the small arms fire. And, um, you know, it was, it was just, just a drill. And sometimes, you know, your stomach is in knots. My, my legs would jump from spasms from fear. And I'd be beating my legs with my fist to control the fear. But anyway, it turns out, well, but that adrenaline flows. It's, it's incredible. It's, it's such an exhilarating sensation to be up there fighting. If I may ask you a question, and I know we're digressing slightly, but we have you here now. In the first place, that story that the uh, rotors are turning and it's forcing wind down will deflect the bullet. That's obviously not the truth. That's Hollywood. No, that is that. No way it'll happen. 
the bullets come, the bullets pass through that ear like you cannot believe. With you as a but pilot. Did, yeah. No, sorry, I'm listening. But what I did determine when the bullets are coming, particularly the anti-aircraft stuff like the 14 fives and the 23 mils and 12 seven. I have a theory and lots of people are going to shoot me down, but it worked for me and it kept me going. When you can see the chaser, then you know that bullet's not coming towards you because the chaser is at the back of that bullet. It's when that bullet, you know, you've got a trajectory, so you've got a, a path of flow. So when you see the tracer coming towards you, you say, okay, okay, we're okay. And then when it disappears, then you start, okay, now you start computing in your mind, where is that bullet going? And then most of the time, 99% of the time, you see the tracer coming again, then you know they are going to miss you. So you're fine, no problem. I never believed in, you know, the alouette's too slow and we were heavy. If you start dog, you know, sort of jinking and turning and stuff like that, it doesn't work. For me, you just carry on straight because, you know, the sooner you get out of that 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 firing arc, that arc of fire, that or your distance, your effective distance, the better. And so, if you start turning and tight turns and climbing and descent, you're just going to bleed off speed. So it's better just to keep on going straight and and just remember, there's a God up there; He's looking after you. <laughs> so you get through it. <laughs> Would you know if your helicopter is hit? As a pilot, would yes. you do? First of all, you can hear the bullets, even AKs when they come past you, because they're making a sound like a typewriter. It's that that bullet is going, it's passing through. That's it's a shock wave coming off the bullet. So you can hear that. And when that bullet hits the airplane, it's a clunk, you can hear it. So you do hear it, yes. I want to take you back to something which happened just a year or two before this, 1980, when uh, I ran hostage. Drama was taking, taking place of Resident Eagle Claw. And one of the helicopters turned back because it had a warning light on it. And I understand it was quite a serious warning light. And because it turned back because of that warning light, there were not enough helicopters to carry on with the operation. And they've already abandoned the operation at that stage when the accident took place with one helicopter crashed into a, I believe, a C-130, and we know what happened further. As a pilot, sir, where, where do you cut the line? If a warning line starts coming on in that machine of yours, will you carry on or will you turn around? It depends on the warning light. If you have an amber light, which is a cautionary light, it is possible to carry on. If you get a red light, it's a red for a reason. It's a danger warning. It could be a hydraulic. If you lose your hydraulics, you're going to crash. Um, if you have an oil pressure failure in the engine, you are going to crash. <laughs> so it goes about what is that light all about? So 10 to 1, if it was a warning light that made them abort the operation, that helicopter would not have made it. And then everybody would have been dead or captured or whatever. Were there ever any pressure upon the Air Force pilots to bring that machine home, no matter what the cost? You mean, okay. No, I don't think nobody puts pressure on you as a pilot to bring the machine, no matter what the cost. The pressure comes to go and do the job. And that's when you decide if it's worthwhile doing it or not. Once you've done the job, you're going home anyway. <laughs> um, sometimes you might get a warning light or something might happen. Or you might get shot up a bit where the guys will say, carry on. But, you know, it's, I, I never really had that pressure. I had more pressure from the top brass telling me that what I'm doing is wrong. Um, not so much me telling them what the top brass is doing is wrong. Um, no. I think a lot of that might come out in other air forces. In the South African Air Force, no. We were t we, one thing about the South African Air Force is that because of the sanctions, we didn't have that many aircraft. Um, so we had to look after the aircraft. So if you as a pilot were sort of going against the regulations or the rules or whatever you want to call them, or the SOPs, then the top price would fall, come down upon you. But we were never really forced to do something we didn't want to do. I have to ask if... Um... You ever had any problems with army officers refusing to accept Air Force command 
over ground operations? Uh, yeah, except yes, we'd, I'd, once, it happened once or twice, but that was not so much because of the professional soldiers like P2 or the Parabats. We had some of these um, uh, campers, whatever you want to call them, the uh, territorial, what's it? You know, the guys who are doing camps. Sometimes these guys would come in and they would say, um, I want my helicopter to do this. And, you know, I was, in those days, I was fairly stroppy. And, you know, if a guy came in the briefing and said, my helicopter, I'd say, excuse me, sir, it's the Air Force helicopter. We're here in support of you. We follow commands from our top management, not from you. And once you got those groceries sorted out, then it was all right. <laughs> well, I'm yeah. glad to hear that because... Um... No one on this show has ever said anything bad about the South African Air Force to me, ever. And I don't really expect anybody to say anything bad either. But shall we go back to, to the battle? It's going on. The lines have been extended. How long did this take place? How long did the, did the fight continue there that day? Well, I, you know, Kenny and Pete can also give the input. But to me, we started maybe eight, nine o'clock in the morning. Um, we are around a bit of, let's say, let's say eight o'clock. And I think it carried on until well after lunch. You're looking at five or six hours, you know, remember we were 46 on the ground and I think that's including the mortar team. Um, there was 250 people. In the you can't rush that type of operation. You've got to take it slowly. Otherwise you're going to lose people. In fact, in that operation, we lost far too many people as it is. That's less, but it happened. Um, but I, I'd say about five or six hours. I don't know what Kenny or Pete, what are you going to say? Yeah. Chris, can I I'll go there? Uh, with that operation, uh, due to the rain the day before, I think that was an advantage to us because they were caught with their pants down. Their clothes were drying on bushes and the boots were off and, and that. So that helped us. I think it helped us because otherwise we could have been in a lot more trouble than we were. But fortunately, the guys were professional enough to fight. It was a long fight. As I say, I think we started at eight. And by the time we had uh, been through the target area and that I think it was about obviously four o'clock. Not the physical fighting, but after you have to go back through the, uh, the target area and check. And uh, I think it was almost before o'clock when we finished there. But I'm not pit things, but but we were exhausted. Uh, we were only we only had our battle jackets, and uh, it was hot, and, and the terrain was heavy, and it, it was hard going. The guys were exhausted at the end of that fight. I think, of course, to come back to your question of the time, yeah, I think with the, the, the time that we started was, was 8 o'clock. And uh, it continued, and it was it sort of, as Neil also said, the, the fight, we, we went very slowly. It was not a rush thing. We never ran into something. You know, it was more sometimes leopard crawling, hiding, ducking, diving, just lying down. I, I remember times that I was lying on my back, um, just to, 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 to lie on the other side of my body for a change. <laughs> and um, then, yeah, I think we, by two o'clock, I think Nella was shot at about just after two, so, somewhere there. And then, then, then after that, it calmed down, you know, and then we, the choppers came down and sat down on the ground and all that. I remember in the police, they taught us if the contact takes longer than five minutes, you run away and call the army. And uh, so this, just to take it in, in perspective, contacts or skirmishes with the enemy normally didn't take that many hours. This was a major, major thing. May I ask about the officer who passed, who got shot? He just mentioned his name, Nella. See, if I may, can, can we go to the first uh, uh, casualty? Uh, I think Pete will be better to, to talk about full Stuart. Because Nella was at the end of the contact, or at the end of the fight. There were two others in between. And we also had a, a bit of a lull in, in the day when uh, 
Neil called in uh, Instruct, which uh, he can tell you about never, never happened and why it never happened. Because that would have saved our bacon a bit more if they had been on target. Just before you start, I just want to mention here that his sister, Nella's sister, did make a comment, I think, on either. I believe it's a free to battalion old boys who were speaking, Kevin Johnson, Barton James, and uh, Tom Stardin. And she made a comment that she lost a brother there. Uh, yeah, so when you correct. mentioned the, the name bit, uh, they just rang a bell to me. But by all means, let's talk about it the way, the way Black Hair suggested. Okay, um, well, um, yeah. We, when we start the morning with the fight, um, we went, as I said, it was, it was, it, the terrain was terrible. It's rocky. Some places the bush were very low, so you had not enough coverage. And then also because of the rain the previous day, the humidity was very high and it, it was not the nicest circumstances. Um, and then, yeah, we were fighting and going slowly forward. And I think it was just after nine o'clock that morning that Philip Stewart was shot. Um, he was, I mean, I was still talking to him and the next minute I just saw his head going backwards. And um, then I called my lieutenant, J.T. Kerstein, and he crawled towards him. And um, yeah, then he thought he was still alive. Uh, it's a very difficult decision to make to say this guy's dead or not. And um, so um, then I, I can't remember, Neil, if it was you or the other chopper that came in, but in that heavy firefight, the helicopter came in and landed and quickly we loaded Phil Stewart in and took off again. And at that stage, the, the, the bullets were flying left, right and center. It was, it was, I don't know why that chopper wasn't down on the ground, but uh, now, and then so they, they took Phil's body away and uh, then we continued again. And for, I think, I can't remember exactly what time of the day, but like later in the morning, um, one of the one of the uh, Blackie's troops was shot. Uh, I can't recall his name now, Blackie. Uh, Pete, uh, the, the the guy that got shot was Yobi Zhao. He was one of my section leaders. And um, Louis, uh, my my second in command, he called me over the radio and said. Uh, he always been shot in the head. And I, I went behind the line to him and uh, he was stone dead. So I walked, I went back behind the line to my position and we had advanced at that stage. And there was a guy lying there when I left. I thought he was dead. And on my way back, he was busy leopard crawling towards my machine gun of Gomez. And uh, yeah, and I, I he had to get two taps from me. And uh, I was back in my position. And, and as the fight continued, and you say there's uh, nothing ever bad said about the Air Force, but I have to talk about the uh, Air Force pilot that was with us in Op Super, that uh, when I was pinned down, uh, Call him on the radio and, and Neil, in a bit of a panic, I said to him, Neil, you're going to shoot us. You're going to shoot us. You're going to shoot your own guys. And as Neil, as usual, a calm, collected guy, said, don't worry, Blackie, there's a few gooks here in front of you. And uh, the, the gun shot them. And uh, when we advanced later on in the afternoon, when we passed, we realized how close they were and where they were hiding. They were right next to us. And uh, they'd been hit with the 20 mil and, and they didn't look a pretty sight, I promise you. So Neil will have to uh, explain his way out of that one. Uh, to explain my way out of that one, you know, if we take some of our own guys out, then there's more beer to be had the night after. <laughs> 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 no, no, the thing is, that is one thing. If you've got a good gun in a situation like that, I mean, if I remember correctly, you were 
the distance between you and those books wasn't much more than about five meters. And five meters is a bedroom far away. And you know that that terrain, as you said, was so bad. And they would have taken you out. And of course, old Steve, my gunner, Steve Kutsia, he, he was a good shot. So, and, you know, we, we actually planned to miss you. That's why we hit the gooks. No, in fact, let me correct that. We planned to hit you and the vibration of the helicopter just lifted those bullets a little bit more so they took out the gooks. Okay, that's uh, uh, cleared up now. Thanks, Neil. But I'm sure you, <laughs> today you wish you had got me uh. Uh, not really, because you're going to buy the beer tonight. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> no jokes aside. No, that was very close. I must admit, it was very close. But I'm glad to see you alive. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Neil, how quickly do you make such a decision? It happens straight away. You know, going back to the planning, the visualization, you've, you, you go through all the scenarios, what could happen. You, you talk to your engineer. You have your trust in your engineer. And when you're in a situation and he knows there's no time to discuss this, can we do it or can't we do it? It has to be done immediately. Otherwise, people are going to die. So, and look, let's face it. It has happened in time where we, my, my between my, so my, I'm in command of the aircraft, so I'll say myself because I give the orders to shoot, where I have killed or wounded own forces. And that was because, firstly, they didn't identify themselves properly and we weren't properly briefed. Um, but in an actual contact, we've never hit a guy. Um, we've never had an, a blue on blue or accidental death because of the planning and the training we've got on the planning. It's, it's, it goes well. Now, I have a question about the Aloe Head Free. In the first place, I understand it doesn't have great navigational aids. So it, it's a bit limited in, and it's slower too. It's slower than a, than a Super Puma. And I need to understand yes. how long could you stay over the area before you had to, to leave to refuel and re -all? Okay, if we were in the gunship, the gunship, that 20 millimeter cannon was probably about 300 and talk in terms of pounds. But if you, and that's why we left the Army Commander off. But with myself, a pilot and a gunner, uh, we worked on around about one hour 20, and sometimes we pushed the limits a bit to get one and a half hours of fuel. In Rhodesia, with a trooping helicopter, with the four troops, and they were lightly armed, I mean, the RLI troops, we would work on 45 minutes of flying. So we cut down on our fuel. When, the, when there's no weight in the Alouette with a full tank and you've got a full tank, you can probably fly for around about two and a half hours. So we cut down a substantial amount of fuel to be able to stay overhead. And then going back to your, your statement on no navigation, we didn't have any navigation systems. Um, the only navigation system we had was there was a, a, a compass and it wasn't a fancy gyro compass. It was... Um, it was a gyro compass, but it wasn't one of these later model compasses you get today. And it was just map and time, heading map and time. And remember, Angola and South Africa is a very flat, featureless country. And it's quite, it's quite bushy. And so we used to navigate on the Shanas, but it's mainly heading and time. That's it. And we, we became quite adept at navigation, map reading, put it that way. So it's almost dead reckoning. You fly a certain yes. direction at a certain speed. Yes, heading in time, yeah. I was told by one of the Special Forces guys that besides the day glow, the orange day glow, the pilots could also see white. If you had like a white thing on your head instead of day glow uh, orange, they could see you quite far. Is, is that true? Yes. Quite often, you know, sometimes the troops, you get like some of the, you know, the not so much the professional troops like 3-2, the Reckies and the, the Parabats, like the other guys. Um, I don't even remember their names now. In Rhodesia, we call them territorial, but the campers. They, they weren't given day glow as such, but they'd normally have a map. And all they had to do was put their map next to them, and then we'd pick them up. So, you know, day glow green also works, but just a white map on the ground can identify your position. Okay, just thank a, you. Okay. Sorry, I interrupted you now. I 
Oh, no, I was going to say that you know, a map gets dirty. So that's why we prefer Dayglow because, first of all, it's a different color. Uh, generally speaking, the enemy didn't have anything like Dayglow. Um, and it's just, it's, it stood out a little bit better than anything else. Okay, shall we go back? Uh, Blackie, you two were talking, you and Peter, about the casualties that day. Uh, shall we just continue with that quickly? Yeah, the, the, those were the, the two casualties in early on in the day. And then later, Nella from the Stopper Golf 26, the Stopper Group, uh, when they were dropped in the two ravines. Uh, as Neil said, the, the, as soon as they were dropped, they had a heavy contact. And they, they shot um, Nella and the, two of his troop sergeants, I think Bernardo, they went and, and brought him back with the radio. But uh, Dracula was a bit uh, flummoxed when Benella was shot. He just started on the radio, screaming on the radio, send me a white guy, send me a white guy. He was a bit, a bit spooked, I think. And then uh, Wally Aldane, that was in the command group, took over and calmed him down and got him settled down until Peter Burley, the 2RC, joined up with him and took over controller. And then and Neil, he was also taken out of Kasevich straight away. The only guy that wasn't Kasevich straight away was my guy, Yobi Yar. He stayed with us in the battlefield and after the fight, it was a bit of tension because he hadn't been taken out and the other two had been taken out. And fortunately, uh, we managed to get him out. They came back and fetched him before we went uh, to our night uh, temporary base. And then the troops were much happier. But the morale was, their morale was terrible because he hadn't been taken out. And uh, Nella and Phil Stewart had been taken out. Uh, I just, I don't know. sorry, I'd like to, that's, sorry, uh, Quibus. Um, you know, that's an interesting point you brought up there, um, Kenny. Um, you know, as, look, I would be the person who would determine whether a guy would be picked up or not. You guys are putting requests, and then by myself as the aircraft commander would make that decision. My decision, first of all, would be based on is the guy wounded or not. And that's why I think I went and picked up um, the who's the guy that was uh, the guy that was wounded. Take it out. Well, I think I picked it up. No, but he died. Yes, not Stuart, but he died because I went in to pick him up because that was urgent. And also, you know, I think there were, if I remember correctly, there was you said so. There was a lot of firing going on, and I wasn't prepared to let one of the other aircraft go in and pick him up. And that's my responsibility. Um, so I went, I went to pick him up. Now, going back to the guys on the ground, now, if, if there's a lot of action on the go and the helicopters have been utilized shooting, then, you know, I must make that decision. Must I take, if a guy's dead, is it really going to help taking a, a helicopter away from us, giving fire support to other troops um, because of a dead guy? And now, you know, it never occurred to me that that could affect the troop morale if we left a dead guy there. What would occur to me, you know, if a guy's dead, you know, nobody's just going to, you're not going to leave him on the ground and, and hope, for you, hope to find him later on. You would have to leave a troop there with him or a soldier with him just to, first of all, to bring your guys back and also just to guard in case somebody came along. That's something I must think about in the future. That's quite an important thing about the morale. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but as you say, Neil, if a man's dead, you, you don't want to put uh, your fire support or your helicopters or your planes at that danger to, to pick up a dead guy. Yeah. So it also you... uh, that's, also the, uh, that's also a consideration. But it goes about, you know, guy's dead. Um, maybe the helicopters needed somewhere else to give support. Uh, so it's a shitty way of looking at it. But it's part of the operation, yeah. But I understand what you're saying, and that's something to think about. But if you didn't leave that one guy, you might have had to pick up many other dead bodies. Correct. 
if you had yeah. given paid attention to him, but it definitely affected the mob troops' morale. They were actually people remember. They were almost stroppy about it, you know. That it, it yeah. wasn't fair. The others were taken out, and he wasn't taken out, kind of thing. Yeah, no, that's that's something that never crossed my mind. Um, of course, if I can come in here after that, uh, a, a guy was killed, um, Kenneth's um, section leader. Then uh, the fight continued at, after that for quite a, a while still. And then we got to a point where, where things calmed down. And I think I can't remember right, uh, Neil, when, when they called Nella and Peter Burley to walk back. Just to give your viewers maybe an idea of what happened. We were fighting from direction south to north. And then right in front of us, there was like quite a steep um, mountain. Uh, and on top of that mountain is where the mortars, our own mortars were sitting, uh, books and them. And then to the, to the east, there was like a riverbed going through two pieces of mountain and then that river split. And in the one split, uh, Nella was sitting with a few troops and in the other split, uh, Peter Burley was uh, doing the stopper groups. And then they were called back. And so the fight was almost, I mean, there were no more fighting. And I, I, I think if I'm not wrong, the, the helicopters at that stage were sitting on the ground. And then they were walking back. They were not that far, but... Nella was in front of Peter. Peter was like 10 minutes behind him. So they were coming towards us. And then just before they got to us, we could almost see some of their troops walking through the bush. Um, there was one or two guys that was, 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 was caught in between us and them. And then they, they fired at, at them. And that's where Nella got killed. And then Peter was at the back. And he had to run in to come and take over the control and to help and I think at that stage, also the two helicopters were back up in the air and they took care of that problem. And um, then Peter joined the guys and then they walked back to us. And that's where the actually basically then stopped. Of course, if I may, uh, in, the, in the firefight, uh, such a long firefight and, and uh, the Fire ammunition control is a problem, especially in the beginning. The, the fire discipline is very difficult in the beginning because you need to put firepower down till you win the firefight. And fortunately, we were using AKs. And uh, when we did run out of ammunition, when we went past the, the bodies, the, the troops that we were instructed to take all their ammunitions uh, out their magazines, out their pouches, and put them down your shirt so we could uh, have, we didn't have to resup because we didn't have resup. Our resup was on the ground from the, the, the bodies. Uh. And uh, Neil also can tell you that uh, he ran out of, they, they ran out of ammunition quickly in the beginning. And then he also ran out of fuel. And he had to land on the top of the mountain and uh, wait for them to bring fuel from the tactical HQ, which they, I think, I hand pumped it back into your chopper while he was controlling from the top of the, the hill. Neil, maybe you want to tell us about that? Uh, I think that that sort of occurred mainly on that first, first contact we had, you know, when, when the Rekis picked up the guys. On the main battle, we were much more organized and there was a tech HQ not too far away from the battle area. Uh, you know, we had Marion Fluss, where, which was the main headquarters, but then we moved some fuel with a Puma closer by so we wouldn't have to fly too far. Uh, you know, we wouldn't, you know, then we could have more, more gunships overhead. As, well, let me, I'm getting tongue-tied here. We could have a, a fairly continuous top cover from the gunships because look Marion Fluss if I remember correctly was about 20-25 minutes away so you've only got an, an hour and a quarter plus minus hour and a quarter fuel you know to go there 
20 minutes and fly back 20 minutes, you haven't got much time over target. So we moved uh, fuel closer, fuel and ammo. But there's very few occasions that I've run out of ammunition and I've contact. Uh, and that was one of them. In fact, I think I had to replenish two ammo bins. Normally we don't replenish two ammo, but more than we don't, you don't shoot too many rounds anyway. But that day we shot off quite a lot. But you're right, yes. Um, I did have to replenish my ammunition. Gentlemen, I, I have to ask now, what did you find after the battle was completed? Because there will be people here accusing you and myself of uh, killing innocents and uh, refugees. Like I said, we did at Casingo, which is not true. There's an entire episode coming up on Casingo, which is really, really good. Um, what did you find? Well, if I could say so, come in here. From the air point of view, we found many, many people wearing camouflage uniforms, carrying AKs and lots of ammunition and SAM 7s and that sort of stuff. And I haven't seen refugees carrying that. That's the first thing. Secondly, um, which is also quite interesting, after the cleanup operations and the following days, we found a cache of food and it all came from the United Nations, whether that you UNICEF or something, it was all marked United Nations. So obviously, and Red Cross stuff, all the med medicine was from Red Cross, all the food was from United Nations World Food Food Program. And I think somewhere I've even got a picture of a bag with a World Food Program on it. So if they want to say armed terrorists or refugees, they can prove it by saying there's the food, but you've got to eat. No, there were definitely no refugees there. There weren't any civilians, civilians for miles around. No, it was all Swapo terrorists. And, and of course, uh, the, the, the caches and the ammunition that was blown and the ammunition that was taken out, they, they weren't there for a Sunday school picnic. They were definitely there to cause uh, a lot of damage with all that ammunition and mines and whatever we got out the caches and blew. It definitely wasn't uh, civilians. Peter, have you seen any civilians made? First, no, I, I, I didn't see any, unfortunately, no. Because I don't, civilians can survive there. It's in the bloody middle of mountains and there's nothing. Well, I have to say these things because, you know, uh, Part of this program, part of what we try to do at Legacy is to tell the truth, to get our story out, and then people can judge us, by all means. But do not judge unless you have both sides of the story. That's what I always ask people. Now, going back to that civilian side, refugee side, if, if, they were, if we had attacked a refugee camp, we would not have found, you know, civilians in the Vomberland. I'm not talking about in that area, but you wouldn't have found civilians with arms cut off or lips cut off or women raped and violated with sticks and stuff, you know, before they got killed. So those were terrorists. They were brutal, murdering terrorists. There's nothing more to call them. On a, on a lighter side, I remember once, and in fact, Angelo, my wingman, he keeps on criticizing me for this story. You know, when there's, after the Lala battle, you know, you're in the air for a while, you have to get down to talk to your army guys, you know, just to see how things are on the ground, get a feel for what's going on the ground. So towards the end of the contact, I decided I must go and liaise with the army commander, and just have a joint plan, but actually I needed a piss. So I landed, in a, in a sort of cattle crawl to go and speak. I can't remember which, uh, which guy I was talking to. Maybe Kenny, maybe Pete, you will remember. But I landed there and I was chatting to the guy on the ground. It could have been Jan Hogarth who decided it was, uh, he might have come into the area. I'm not quite sure. But while I'm talking, I'm having a piss at the same time. And, and, I, and a, one of the terrorists obviously saw the helicopter land and he wasn't dead. And he shot an RPG into the tree above me. Now, you want to see consternation in the nation when that happens. First of all, I pissed my pants. Secondly, I don't think I've ever started a helicopter so quickly and got back in the air as I did then. 
but that that's sort of more lighter side of things. <laughs> well, I think we can forgive you for that uh, little accident. <laughs> <laughs> But I have to ask something uh, just once again here. Did any of you wear any body armor? Because there's a lot of uh, people who ask me, where were your body armor, things like that? And I say, no, never had it. And they look at me with eyes this big as if I'm uh, some kind of uh, a liar. But so were any I've of you not, wearing body armor? I've never worn body armor. I think I tried it initially when I first went to Rhodesia, but then a, a, a pilot at an engine who's wearing, we used to have these sort of thick body armor plates. And I'm a short guy, I've got a short body. And, you know, our body armor is not really designed for the average guy. And when it comes to sort of physique and stuff like that, I'm below average in terms of length and, and build. So anyway, this guy was pretty much the same build as I did. He had an engine cut and he auto-rotated down ground. And when he hit the ground, the body armor came up and actually broke his neck and crushed his lungs and he died. So I decided, well, I'm not going to wear body armor after that. And of course, a lot of the uh, commanders say you have to wear it, but I don't have to do anything that I don't want to do. But also I had a theory. When you're flying in an alouette in the left-hand orbit, all the bullets are coming from the left-hand side, 95% of the time. So if they're not coming from the front, body armor is not going to help you. And we were in armored seats anyway, although to be after we got armored seats. And so if you... The only time the bullets are going to come, and if you wear body armor, your whole side is exposed. So what the, why do you need body armor? I never wore body, body armor, but the gunners normally did. Most of the gunners I flew would wear body armor. I wouldn't do it. So that or some of the pilots did, but mostly the, the, they did not do it. But we had an armored seat, so I decided that's sufficient. Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's all I can say. I don't believe in body armor. Because maybe because I'm too stubborn. And maybe I'm at those days, you know, when you're young, you know, you're young and brave. There's that song by the Paula Tones, Young and Brave. That's the sort of theme song. <laughs> you don't need body armor when you're young and brave because you're invincible. <laughs> okay, you and Pete, were you wearing body armor, steel helmets, overloaded? Nothing. Uh, just. Uh... Our shirts and our battle jackets, and uh, when we moved our heavy kits, that's all. But no, no body armor. I think a few guys got hit in with, on the hand grenades that we were in front, white forces. Then they learned to put them at the back. Lessons learned. You put them out the way. But the lot, the only. Body armor that saved a couple of guys, uh, I think their magazines or their water bottles that they got hit in the water bottle, but no body armor. Yeah, I can Maybe say that some... we, we never won any body armor. And uh, as Blackie say, that the, 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 we, our uh, uh, vests that we were wearing with the, with the um, magazines were all in front of your chest. So I think lots of guys were saved by that when when they shoot into that, you know, that was sort of a, a cover. But yeah, we never had anything else. If you're looking back now, and you're all mature men. Sorry, Robert. Yeah? Robert, one more on the body armor story. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. When you're doing fire force, your troops, first of all, it's, you know, you need physically fit guys to do that. And guys must be able to move. And Blackie and Pete, will be, you know, I'm, I'm not a ground guy, but I, I can see what they go through. You've got to be able to move. You've got to be able to duck and dive and get into cover and move forward and fire a movement. And once, if you start wearing the kit that you see these guys, the modern soldiers wearing today, they can't move. They are so heavy and laden with body armor and all kinds of other nonsense that they have to wear that they were, I can't see them being very successful in a fire force operation. You know, light infantry, Rhodesia light infantry, the Brits had the light infantry. I mean, they carried minimal stuff. They would run. And that's what it's all about, is to be able to run, not just be lumber along over, you know, overladen with kit. Yeah, well, it's beat this armor and the way the guys are loaded today, they can't move, which means we're just yeah. lumbering around and they will die. And that's why they're suffering all these losses. I've said it before. 
But well, what I wanted to know is, is looking back now, many years later, would you consider this to be one of the vicious firefights of the war? Or was it perhaps not as important as I said in the beginning that it was one of the major, the major battles? From my perspective, and Kenny and Pete can come in from my perspective, as first of all, as the air commander, and because I was controlling the troops on the ground, it, to me, it was extremely successful. And if it wasn't for a small mishap that we, that, that you know, we had to call it, the, the pilot jets were sent out there for a ground strike, which never materialized, we, were going to, we would have killed more people. Um, we could have killed well over 200 guys. Um, you know, just the fact is that we killed what, 180 or 190 guys shows how successful it was. And we were only, what, 45, 46 on the ground. It was, I think it was probably one of the best, better operations that the SADF has ever had. Neil, I have to agree with you there. Because there, were, there was no um, armored vehicles or, or the aircraft. It was just men on men on the ground. And we were outnumbered. So I think being outnumbered by so many soldiers and by our losses, we only had three losses, shows the professionalism of, of the guys that were on the ground. And another thing that the, the attack group on the ground, I didn't know Pete Nettling, I didn't know, we didn't know any of the guys. We had never worked together. Maybe in the platoons we'd worked together. I'd worked with Louis and uh, Pete had worked with JC, but we didn't know each other. We were professionals. We, I think we did really well. Eh? And I, I know we, in 2010, we went back to Angola with the enemy, with the Cosmo Craft and a few guys. We just fought for the government of the day. We weren't enemies. We brought with swapper guys there in, in Vintuk. It's the politicians that must go to war, not us. Uh, as I say, I'm very proud of that operation. Um, and I'm sure we all can be. You can't go to war without killing people and or else you get killed. So it's either you or the enemy. And my stance was it's rather them than me. Well, the better part of the operation is that we were on our own. We did our planning. We had no interference from all the generals and stuff because they were just too far away. Fantastic. Pete, do you have uh, something to say uh, about the importance of this battle? No, uh, Chris. I mean, I've been, I've been the other big ops I was in it was Operation Super, but that was uh, not Operation Super, Operation Britia. And uh, in a few other smaller contexts, but um, yeah, this was the bigger one I was in. It was for me. It was a it was a long day, and I was tired. And what happened the next day? Were you just policing the area, clearing up, finding that uh, cache we were talking about? Of course, uh, if, if I may, um, my company Foxtrot was coming. No, we had two weeks. They still had two weeks in the base. And uh, Elkhart said to me, yeah, now you might as well just see the two weeks out. So we went into area ops with uh, the Alpha guys because there was apparently another base that we had to go and find. Well, and, and the boat, there was apparently a boat that was, but we never found either of it. And um, after that two weeks, when we got uh, lifted out, to go back to, the guys went back to Buffalo. Uh, Lou and I had to stay for another bush trip because our company had had their, their leave and now they were coming back. We had just stayed in the bush from Christmas Day till, the, till May. So we were in the bush for five months. So eventually when we got back to uh, Hurricane Base Rikona, uh, Louis organized the troops as much beer as they can and because they were fatigued. That, that's a long time to be away from their families. Some of them got families. And uh, I hooked up with an anti-aircraft parabat friend of mine that was at school with me. And I managed to buy two bottles of rum and we cared that night. 
and at about three in the morning, it was early hours of the morning, Wally Haldane came and woke me up and he said, Captain Clay wants to see you. Your troops are running a mock in a corner town. So I said to him, tell him he can go and find them. I'm not going to find them. Not in that position. And anyway, I've got uh, clawed on for that. I've got a DD-1. And uh, when I got back to Buffalo, Falcon, our officer commanding, old, uh, Leon Ferreira, he just said, uh, well done. And he just tore that DD-1 up in front of me and he said, mm, don't worry about it. Uh, you did it. might have done good work. But we were in the bush for five months. It's a long time. Uh. And I was meant to go home twice in those five months where my leave was cancelled due to push duty. Uh. But eventually I did go on leave and uh, Pete came and stayed at my house one night. So, yeah. And the nice thing about Super is uh, there's, there's still a lot of us around so that we're still alive and we're still in contact with each other. Like Pete and I, Peter Burley in Australia, and Wally Aldania in Joburg, and Louis in Mozambique. So you must also get their side of the story, I think. Uh, because we're all in the same place, and we've all got a different story to tell. You don't believe that we were there, because we all had different walks of fire. So yeah, no, it, it was good. Pete, what happened to you afterwards? Um, of course, yeah, we stayed um, in the area and we, we worked there for another, I think, about a week. And in the meantime, they then moved the rest of Alpha Company into that area. And the tactical HQ was still based at Marian Flush. And then they decided to move us out because we were so, um, like, tired and... Yeah, it was a long time and an hard time on the troops, and they decided to move us back out to the to Marian Flush, and we then stayed there um, until the end of that ops. And the rest of the company was um, at that stage um, in the area around where where the physical contact was. And Neil, did they withdraw the air force? The Air Force, yeah, they, 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 they left and we only had one, one signaler and a tent at Marian Flush. And that was it. And uh, the nicest was every second day you could go to the river, get some water and have a swim and then come back. And Neil, is there anything you want to say about uh, going on to other operations, moving on? You mean uh, after Super or at Super? Yes, when Super came to an end. The next day, or uh, we, no, I stayed on because there was a there was a possibility of another fight, um, because there, there were the, as Kenny mentioned, the one base close by. But after about a week, I think we, I think I stayed another ten days, and the air force was pulled out, and we all went back home. Uh, and then, then it was just sitting at home doing normal everyday operations with Kufut, and then every now and then three two. Life became very boring after that. It was fine. <laughs> I asked a question which many has asked me to ask you, Mr. Ellis. Did you actually succeed in catching fish there at the Kunene River mouth, or did you really never go there? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> we couldn't find, I couldn't find a fishing boat. You know, we had lots of things like AKs and weapons and stuff, but nobody had the decency to bring a fishing rod to Andongwa. <laughs> No, there was no fishing. <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny, actually. When, when Boris was talking about this, he was like, I, I couldn't believe. I said to me, I had no fuel. But then I had to call somebody, and this somebody called the Hercules, and then they dropped the fuel. And he... <laughs> yeah, that, that, you know, that, that something to show you, once, once the information had been developed, and you realize now there was a target, I must say the way the, the, the let's say the defense force or the guys in, in on Dongwa sector one zero got their act together and the air force as well everybody first of all we got extra troopers I mean they were the, the three two guys who flown in straight away then food you know it goes about logistics ammunition food but then fuel 
you know, we had a Dakota with us, and that could bring in the food. There weren't that many people, but you know, with five pumas and four elevates, so fuel's a major thing. And the Air Force managed to get fly up a C-160 from Pretoria, and they brought that. They dropped that that drop that that aircraft must have taken off in the very very early hours in the morning because we got a fuel drop of a full load um, of fuel. Um, from that C-160 airdrop and pallets. So to just, just the fact that the guys were able to put that together in hours says a lot for the organization and our, our, our doggies. I was, I was really impressed at that. Yes, it was a magnificent effort, effort by everyone. Yes. Now, it's been a pleasure, gentlemen. I must tell you, thank you so much for coming on the show. I want to say to anybody who listened here, if you serve, you're not unimportant. No one was unimportant. So come and talk to me if you really, well, come and talk to me. If you think you've got a story, come and talk to me. You're welcome. And until we meet again, God bless. Same as